Hello and welcome to The Pod. I'm Nathan Fink. I'm Jasmine Torres-Allen, and this is New Hampshire Family Now. A show about building family in the Granite State. Today in the podcast, Jasmine and I talk travel, identity, and sort through some big feelings. And later, Dr. Julie Bozak, director at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, joins us to discuss a perinatal public health opportunity. New Hampshire Family Now is brought to you by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Since 1962, the Charitable Foundation has worked hand-in-hand with generous and visionary citizens to maximize the power of giving and support, collaborate, and lead innovative initiatives. Initiatives like New Hampshire Tomorrow, which is focused on making sure children and families have access to education, health care, and career pathways to ensure every family member thrives. To learn more about New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and all their initiatives, go to www. Dot nhcf.org. This podcast was also brought to you by Family Support New Hampshire. Family Support New Hampshire is NH's coalition of family resource centers and family strengthening programs that exist to ensure Granite State families have access to resources so both caregivers and children can succeed because supported families are strong families. To find a family resource center near you, visit www.fsnh.org. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Nathan Fink. And I'm Jasmine. We have a great show for you today. But first, Jasmine is back from what, Puerto Rico? I'm back. Puerto Rico, D.C. Yeah. Virginia? Yeah. So I was like, whew, it was a crazy couple of weeks. Oh, my God. <laughs> so tell me, because, you know, one, I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, what was the best thing from your travels? Um, you know, I got to experience and learn a lot more about my island, about my history and my the indigenous indigenous roots. And I got to taste like a lot of Puerto Rican products, coffee and chocolate in particular. Really? Yes. And it was, it was delicious and caffeinated all at the same time. (laughs) So, okay. I I am fascinated by this because you grew up in mass, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's just, and and that's, it's where my family comes from. I've traveled between Massachusetts and Puerto Rico my entire life and spent a lot of my, my summers, my childhood in Puerto Rico. And so it was amazing and it's kind of um, like I tell people it's a it's a weird transition to go from when you go visit Puerto Rico there was no Wi-Fi there was no like mm. there was a time where I would I was completely off grid now I'm like I have service and yeah. <laughs> Wi-Fi and there's so much there's so yeah. much to Puerto Rico that uh, people don't understand that there is because it's more than just coast there's a lot of yeah. mountains and a lot of special people and communities yeah. and a lot of pride yeah yeah now tell me How'd your kids like oh it? Oh my God, they loved it. My daughter asks me all the time when we're going back. Really? <laughs> yeah, they loved it. And for my son, it was interesting because the first time we went was really tough on him. It was probably one of the worst In times. In what, what way? It, he was just, he'd never been to, well, he'd been to the beach, but he had fear of the waves. Oh, and yeah. like. He didn't like getting in the pool. He was hot all the time. He was aggravated. And those two yeah. things are both solutions to <laughs> yes. the other thing. And if you can't get that child in the water on a hot day, yeah. you know, they're going to be cranky. And, you know, and it was our first time as a family on vacation. And he hadn't been on vacation like that before. And right. so for us, it was a huge adjustment, one, to have two kids because we never had two kids before that. Right. And the other was, you know, trying to adjust to a child that isn't used to going on vacation and isn't used to traveling. My daughter had already been used to traveling. Right. And so we were trying to navigate the waters of how to try to make him comfortable and find pieces in the vacation time that would make him feel safe and happy. Yeah. And, and we did. There was He rode a horse on the beach and that Love was it. the entire time that was his highlight of the entire vacation. And if that's all I could do, then that's, that's all I could do. <laughs> yeah. You know, but the second time around, now that he knew what to expect, it was so much easier, so much better. And he got in the water and I was like, whoo, small progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's the so, little you know, it was just those little things that made it better. And um, you know how sometimes you tell your kids, like, I see everything. I have eyes in the back mm-hmm. of my head. And so while we were in Puerto Rico, I said, I see everything. I have eyes in the back of my head. And my daughter for some reason took that and she I overheard her talking to to my son and she goes, I'm half Puerto Rican. I have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> I can see everything. <laughs> and, and 
my son goes, well, I want to be Puerto Rican so I can see everything. And it was just really funny. And it's you more know, expensive, though, because you need two sets of sunglasses. Yes. And two sets of hats and all that fun <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Man, it's a kid after my own heart, though. I, I feel you're saying he's been irritable lately. I have totally been in that. Oh, yeah. Tell I'm me about it. I don't I don't know what it is. Like, I you know how you just it's like funk. Mm. You get in a funk and you kind of are down like it's. It's a nice day. Like, I feel good. But it's a I, sunny day. It's yeah. a sunny day. Mm-hmm. I feel like I can't find the edge of it. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. sometimes you can kind of find the edge. And, like, I'm feeling around going, what is this thing? Like, I, I don't even know how to... I don't feel in control of my emotions. Mm. Literally, I just watched an AI-generated heart walk video. 30 seconds. AI-generated. And I thought I was going to cry. Oh, my gosh. Right? Wow. And it probably probably can't tell from the tone of my voice. Right. But, like, everything feels... I don't know. Do you, do you go in those cycles? Absolutely. More so often, though, I find myself practicing, like, radical, like, honesty. Huh. And just literally saying out loud how I feel. Mm. And I think it takes people back a little bit because like you know when someone asks you like how are you doing and I'm like I'm actually hanging in there. <laughs> you yeah, know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Like, and I, I'm not going to lie. It puts me in an uncomfortable spot, too, because sometimes we're very used to going like, we're good. We're great. You know what I mean? Like, that's the automatic response because you don't want to burden someone around you. But right. I feel like it's the opposite when you're honest, because then someone knows how to approach you in a different right. manner. Yeah. When you let someone know how you're actually feeling, they make a little bit of space or room for your emotions to actually pour out. I, I, I agree. And I, I don't know what it is. You know, on our last episode, obviously, with the this is my brave cast now I'm in New Hampshire. We've been working on this project and I'm so proud to have been a part of that and, you know, the performance and, and, and whatnot. And I've been thinking a lot about what Don, that Don McCullough, the firefighter was saying about over the course of your life, you have all these experiences, right? And that we have never quite been able to teach our offspring how to like reckon with them yes and at a certain point it, maybe it's because i'm you know again my birthday's coming maybe it's that i'm like in this middle <laughs> the middling, self-reflective yes, mode. Oh, right? i get that in that fun yeah. too yeah so I, i'm thinking about that though a lot lately because i don't think that i've ever taken the time to process mm. you know what i mean because you're moving 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 all the time and it's like when they say sometimes for some people when they experience grief they experience it way later after someone's death because yeah. they in that moment they're too focused on everything that's going on around them. They've got to keep participating right. in life. And then when you do have that moment, it just hits you. Yeah. It hits you and, and you're like, thick, whoa, you, you know? know, and you're carrying it around and yeah. you're like, wait a minute, I have to navigate life with this, you yeah. know, kind of baggage with me. You know what I mean? But what do you do when you don't know what it is you're carrying? Mm, that's interesting. I think I'm still dealing with that. Yeah. I tell people, like, I go through these, uh, these waves of... I would call it depression because I I experienced depression daily in my life. And there are waves that are deeper than others. Right. And what I've come to learn is that if I don't feel those in those moments when I have them or when I experience them, they just continue to pile up. And then I have more explosive moments or I spill on the people around me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, you know, they're the catch all, you know. And so I find that a lot of time... When I experience those moments, I write. I try to find a creative outlet. And if you don't know what you're you're experiencing or feeling and you don't have the verbiage to express it, it just stays in your body. Mm-hmm. And so I always try to find ways to, to let it exit my body in some way, shape, or form, whether mm-hmm. that's art, whether that's movement, whether that's going for a road trip up to the mountains. It's almost like I give permission to my body to release those emotions in those times. You know, what? one of the most powerful things somebody has said to me about being a friend mm. is being available to just sit with it with somebody, mm-hmm. beside somebody. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm uh, Paul Simon and our Garfunkel. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Yes, I love that one. <laughs> but, you know, I have to. I got to switch to Here Comes the Sun. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Here comes yeah. the sun. <laughs> Here comes the sun. It's all right. And when we come back, we welcome Dr. Julie Bozak. Don't go anywhere. 
Today's show was brought to you by Bank of New Hampshire. For 193 years, Bank of New Hampshire has put customers and communities first. With the expertise to help you realize your goals, their technology makes banking easier and the friendly faces will make you want to visit in person. Want a bank that has your back? Bank of New Hampshire are your people. For more information, visit bnh.bank or call 1-800-832-0912. Member FDIC. Today's podcast was brought to you by Dartmouth Health Children's. As the only comprehensive pediatric healthcare system in the region, Dartmouth Health Children's promotes health, advances knowledge, and delivers the best patient and family-centered care for infants, children, and adolescents. Shared knowledge from expert providers across the system increases their ability to care for patients and families close to home. From annual checkups to specialized treatments, Dartmouth Health Children's is dedicated to ensuring all children live their happiest, healthiest lives. For more information, visit childrensdartmouthhealth.org. That's childrens.dartmouth-health.org. Merrimack County Savings Bank, where Merrimack style is treating everyone with care, respect, and compassion, proudly supports the mission and efforts of New Hampshire Children's Trust. Founded in 1867, the Merrimack has served people, businesses, nonprofits, and municipalities in central and southern New Hampshire for over 157 years. Visit local offices in Bow, Concord, Contucook, Hooksit, Nashua, and Wyndham, or go to themerrimack.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today on the show, I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Julie Bozak, Director of Population Health at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, leading the work of Northern New England Perinatal Quality Improvement Network and NH's Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Dr. Bozak, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Now, I'm thrilled to have you here, especially given that May is Mental Health Awareness Month and that the perinatal period represents a real public health opportunity for New Hampshire families. But as a quick level set, what does the perinatal period encompass and why is it so incredibly important? Sure. Um, So perinatal is from the moment a woman becomes pregnant and then through the full year postpartum, um, because we recognize that that time frame is such, you know, such an important time frame, both in what's happening for the woman physiologically, you know, how that impacts the baby. And then also just met, you know, the mental and emotional aspects that go along with going through pregnancy and becoming a new parent. So we, we now know we really need to look at that whole time frame as opposed to just focusing on the, on the pregnancy. Yeah. Now from the public health lens, when we talk about the opportunity in this period, what does that opportunity actually look like? There's so much opportunity. I mean, from a very um, sort of clinical perspective, just think, you know, a woman presents for prenatal care. Having been a nurse midwife for 25 years, you know, women show up regardless of what their reality is. They care about being a good mom and a good parent and doing the right thing. Whether or not someone has the support and ability to do all the things correctly is another story, but still they're invested emotionally, right? in trying to do the right thing through the prenatal time frame and as a new parent. And then they interact with the healthcare system more probably than you ever do in your entire life, right? So if you show up for all your prenatal appointments and your postpartum appointments, you're having between 12 and 14 times that you're interacting with the healthcare system. So it's this incredible opportunity of when we we are seeing people and we can connect with them and engage them if we can do that well. And then in the postpartum time, one, they can continue to be seeing their prenatal OB provider. And then they also are starting to be seen by a pediatric provider. So there is this you know, ongoing ability to be seeing and engaging a woman and her care of the newborn over that two year time frame. Yes. Now, I want to pick up on something you said, the idea that whether or not we have resources is another story. Because when my wife and I had our first child, while we thought we had resources lined up, it turns out that the resources we thought we needed paled in comparison to what we would need. What are some of those resources that you're referring to and how can we as a society think about ensuring greater access to them? So that's a great question. Um, And I think just as a precursor, I want to say, you know, as I'm sort of talking about challenges and issues with our system, um, I know that, you know, the people who are showing up and doing this work in our state, like we're showing up with our whole heart and really trying to do our best. And that what the challenges that are presented to us, um, it's not any one person's ill will or any, you know, bad policy decision. It's just this reality of what has evolved over time. So I sometimes I feel I worry that it sounds too critical 
critical, right? And that I don't want people to feel feel put off that we are criticizing all the good work that is really happening out there in the state. And there is an amazing amount of resources that people are don't either don't know about, so they don't know how to find them. They're not aware that they exist, and then they're not able to take advantage of them. And we hear consistently from the communities, from women that we care for, from the providers, um, that that exact problem of how do we ensure that people are aware that the resources are out there and then that they feel comfortable asking for that help. So there's so much built into around judgment and stigma and fear about asking for home visiting or asking for um, extra support because you're struggling with um, postpartum depression or even just, you know, struggling with becoming a new parent. Like it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do in life and we all need extra support. So how do we normalize that asking for extra help and support is okay? And that doesn't mean you're doing a bad job. It doesn't mean that somebody's going to point out to you um, that, you know, you're not being a fit parent. Um, It's just a normal and okay process to say, I need a little bit of extra support and help. Now, how do we then get to what you said in terms of normalizing the fact that this isn't easy parenting? It's, It's really, really hard. And likely you'll have adverse feelings around being a parent. I think it's, you know, continuing to have these conversations and making it clear. Um, so it's both as a, you know, a culture. So I don't know if it's a you know marketing campaign, if it's having podcasts and articles, but then also as a provider, I know I used to say to women and their partners or birthing people and their partners, as we would get towards that, the end of a pregnancy, um, I would talk about how being a new parent is incredible. It's this flood of emotion and positivity, but it's not all positive and it's really hard and really tough talk through what those challenges were going to be. And I mean, appropriate or not, I sometimes would share my own experience. Um, I was very fortunate that I, my oldest daughter, I lived in a system where home visiting was the norm. So it wasn't, you know, only for high risk or people who had concerns. It was everybody that it was the UK, you know, UK system. Everybody got a home visitor. And I thought, I'm a midwife. I have a partner. Like, I don't have any high risk, you know, factors that are a problem. I don't need somebody to come, you know, come to my home on a regular basis. Oh my goodness. I was so happy. Every time my midwife showed up, they would, they came every day for the first 10 days and then every couple of days. And then for the first six weeks on a regular visit on a regular time frame. I mean, it was, I had so many questions. I would often cry and sort of work through stuff. And it was the best thing that helped me transition into being a new parent. However, if you had gone based on, you know, risk or sort of my own self-perceived need, I would have said, oh no, 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 I don't, I don't need that additional additional support. But because it was normalized and that was just part of what happened, you know, just like we say, oh, you're showing up, you know, you're supposed to go to the dentist twice a year. The home visitor is going to show up and, you know, and talk to you and be there for support. And it made a massive difference for me in my ability to transition into being Mm. a new parent. You said something that really struck me in terms of doing it well and provider supporting parents. And I wanted to talk a bit about the second paper in your dissertation, which highlights these small but significant steps to improve outcomes for parents along the continuum of care. Can you walk me through from the baseline engagement of someone going through the process to co-planning for something like prevention or preventative services? I think if we talk about it on just the, you know, the patient level and we think about as a newly pregnant person, you start with that phone call to the OB office and how that person sounds on the phone to you and how receptive they are. Are they in a good mood? Are they in a bad mood? Do they ask you how you're feeling? Um, that sort of sets the tone for how you're going to present to the office. And that happens in so many small instances throughout the entire pregnancy. And I think as a healthcare system and as providers, we underestimate the impact of how all those little moments um, can be very negatively perceived by the people we're caring for. So it's not necessarily ill intent. Like who knows, like maybe I just, you know, had a fight before I showed up in the office with, you know, trying to get my eight-year-old to school in the morning, right? So I sound a little more annoyed um, and that comes off in a negative way. And so, you know, really being aware of how, how we're speaking and how we're engaging with people um, so that they were present, they feel that they're seen, they feel that they're heard. Um, We aren't just working through our 
our criteria and our checklist that needs to happen because there's so much that we're trying to fit into um, that we're told we need to fit into care. I try to start every prenatal visit with like, how are you? Like, what do you want to talk about? And giving that space for people to really show up is what co-production or co-planning is all about, is that you're really trying to prioritize what the patient and the person in front of you's needs are so that you can together work through the process. And I think that that sadly gets lost so much in our medical system because of all the requirements that are put on and because of time constraints and because of just, you know, system aspects that that human piece of people really feeling seen and heard is gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. I want to lean into a concept that kept jumping out at me because I love the idea of safe spaces, that every human interaction along the chain is in fact an opportunity to create them. But I'm wrestling with efficiency, that efficiency could mean you potentially see more human beings. But efficiency doesn't mean that we're going to be more human in those interactions, no? Yes, very true. However, I think one thing that I often hear providers say is, well, I don't have the time. And actually having a human interaction and what came through in my dissertation research doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, it can be that 30 seconds of you are looking somebody in the eye, you are have taken a deep breath and you ask them, how are you? And that people feel, you feel the difference of that, right? Versus someone who is stressed and rushed. And I think as providers, I know, right? When you have 20, 25 people on your schedule, you're like trying to chug through the day and you just need to remind yourself to take a deep breath and look someone in the eye and really ask them how they are. And you might not be able to listen to a 45 minute, you know, ongoing of everything that happened, but you can at least help them feel like they've been, um, they've been seen as being human and that it's important as to what their their feelings and their state of mind is. And, you know, you brought up the difference of how you respond and as a patient, right, as someone who's in the room, how you respond when you feel like somebody is really seeing you and, and asking. And we know so much of what impacts people's well-being, both their own health and their, you know, their baby's health, is behavior change, right, as to all the different choices that we make throughout the day. And for people to really want to feel like it matters and engage and make behavior change, they need to feel like you care and they need to be given that time. And what I often say to um, in trying to explain the difference to other providers or residents is we need to lower our expectations of what we're going to accomplish in a visit. And so if you're trying to help somebody through a process or to understand something, you're not going to maybe check the entire checklist. You're not going to necessarily solve it by the end of a 20 minute visit, but you're going to get a lot further towards actually the the overall goal, right, of somebody moving into a better place, if you spend five minutes talking about why they had a really hard morning, right? And right. then they're going to trust you. They're going to disclose a couple of things. They're going to be able to maybe by the end of that visit, you can say to them, you know, what do you think is a reasonable thing for you to work on before the right. next visit, as opposed to trying to solve the whole problem, you know, in a 20 minute period. So recognizing all those drops in the bucket along the way. Interesting, because you as providers also are human too. And so adding 30 seconds to talk to someone else, you actually might need to add an additional 30 seconds to talk to yourself before that person gets in the room for a little self-care. Yeah, it's absolutely um, very important. I mean, and we hear repeatedly, I mean, and I know for myself, the healthcare providers are, they're burnt out, they're exhausted, they don't feel like they're being supported, and that we need to figure out a better way to create a whole culture of caring in our healthcare system, because you can't show up and be present and care for the people you're caring for, if you don't feel like you're supported. Um, and we do, when you look at like trauma informed care and different, you know, all the different important approaches that we need to be taking across the board in providing care. Um, part of it is like taking that self-stock before you walk in the room, taking a deep breath, checking in with yourself, with your own, you know, your own emotions that are going on. So you can then show up and be present and caring in the room. Now, in your work with the Northern New England Perinatal Quality Improvement Network and the NH Perinatal Quality Collaborative, are you seeing those types of improvements to structures taking root? 
And if so, what does that impact look like thus far? That's a great question. And yeah, yes. I mean, I think the reality is everybody recognizes that something needs to change and that what we're doing right now is not working, right? We hear that from patients, from mothers, from fathers, that they're not feeling like their needs are being met, that they don't know how to find resources, that they don't feel like they're being seen and heard in their healthcare experiences. Um, and then we're hearing from the provider side as well, that they don't feel like they can be the providers that they want to be because of the way the system is currently set up. So there is this buy-in and energy to approaching things differently because everyone wants, you know, everyone wants the same thing, right? You don't become a healthcare provider because you don't care about people having a good experience. Um, you want them to have a good experience and have good outcomes and to be the best parents that they can be. But it's hard if you're caught in a system that isn't allowing that. You know, specifically, if we think about the example of perinatal mental health conditions, we are doing an improvement effort right now where all 15 birthing hospitals are engaged. We are engaging the community sites and providers, and people are really ready and willing to start looking at improvements and how they can shift their processes and how they interact with patients so that they can be doing a better job and we can be improving improving patients' experiences and improving the outcomes. Um, the other way that we are seeing lots of enthusiasm is the New Hampshire Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Our goal is we are really thinking about the full birthing community as our members. So we are looking at standing up coalitions in all of the different birthing communities in our state. And this is bringing everybody to the table. So it's the, pa it's the patients and the support members and the community organizations and the hospital um, providers and staff. But the they all need to come around a table and figure out, you know, what the priorities are for their communities, um, which most of them are saying perinatal mental health conditions, you know, are a, are a significant priority and what's going to work best for their community to make these improvements. And we are seeing lots of excitement and enthusiasm around approaching something in a different way because people want, you know, want to do better. Dr. Bozak, I so appreciate this conversation and thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. This podcast was brought to you by Nixon Peabody, who delivers exceptional legal services for clients in the community by combining high performance, an entrepreneurial spirit, deep engagement, and an unwavering commitment to a culture of collaboration, diversity, and humanity. Nixon Peabody works with universities, hospitals, and nonprofits of every size to maximize impact. For more information, visit nixonpeabody.com. Many thanks to the Samuel P. Hunt Foundation for sponsoring this podcast. Established in 1951, Samuel P. Hunt Foundation is a Manchester-based, independent nonprofit that provides grants primarily for the arts, children and youth services, faith-based organizations, educational institutions, healthcare, and human services. New Hampshire Family Now is listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or ask your smart speaker to play New Hampshire Family Now. 